Stories and Documentary Network. Welcome to the ancient cradle of civilization, a land of breathtaking landscapes and an intricate tapestry of history. Nestled in the heart of the Middle East, in the region known as Mesopotamia, lies the enigmatic story of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians, often overshadowed by the grandeur of their neighboring empires, were a force to be reckoned with in the annals of history. The land they once dominated remains scattered with silent echoes of their rise and fall, bearing testament to their might, innovation, and cultural contributions. Among the ruins, the city of Nineveh stands as a testament to the magnificence of Assyrian architecture and ambition. Its colossal walls and impressive gates were once a symbol of power and an embodiment of the grandeur of this ancient civilization. The Assyrians were not only masters of warfare but also prolific in art, literature, and governance. Their intricate relief sculptures, adorned with scenes of conquests, rituals, and daily life, showcased their artistic finesse and cultural narratives. Surrounded by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the Assyrians emerged from the cradle of civilization, charting a path that would influence the trajectory of ancient history. Their innovations, military strategies, and cultural advancements not only shaped their empire but also left an indelible mark on the ancient world. Join us as we delve into the layers of time, exploring the rise, grandeur, and enigmatic legacy of the Assyrian Empire. A journey that unfolds the mysteries of an empire that shaped history, yet often remains veiled in the sands of time. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Let's start. In the cradle of human civilization, where the fertile plains of Mesopotamia bore the footprints of history, emerged the modest city-states that would pave the way for an empire to rise. These early communities thrived along the riverbanks of the Tigris and Euphrates, establishing the foundation for what would become the mighty Assyrian civilization. Amidst the meandering rivers and fertile lands of Mesopotamia lay a shore, the heart from which the Assyrian Empire would beat. From its humble origins, this city burgeoned into a kingdom, marking the inception of an empire that would leave an indelible mark on the pages of history. The ancient kingdom of Assyria was located in present-day northern Iraq. It bordered eastern Syria and southeastern Asia Minor. It covered the most northerly portion of the Mesopotamian plain, with the river Tigris flowing through it. The land was flanked to the north and east by the Zagros Mountains, to the west and south by desert. The climate of northern Mesopotamia is cooler than in southern Mesopotamia, and the levels of rainfall higher. This means that irrigation is not essential to farming, though, as with agriculture in many parts of the world, it does allow more intensive farming than would otherwise be the case. Assyria belonged to the world of ancient Mesopotamia. However, whilst steeped in Mesopotamian culture from early times, Assyrian society developed some distinct features of its own. Its exposed position, bordering as it did lands of warlike mountain peoples and desert tribesmen, meant that its people developed a strong military tradition. This enabled them to survive periods of invasion, and then to conquer the largest empire world history had yet seen. At its height this empire stretched from Egypt to the Persian Gulf, taking in the areas covered by the modern countries of Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, plus parts of Jordan, Turkey, Armenia and Iran on the way. During the reign of King Tukulti Ninurta I, the Assyrian Empire experienced a transformative era that reshaped the course of its history. Taking the throne around 1243 BC, Tukulti Ninurta I initiated a period marked by a colossal shift in Assyrian power, steering the empire towards unprecedented heights of expansion and influence across the ancient world. Upon ascending to the throne, Tukulti Ninurta I embarked on audacious campaigns that altered the trajectory of the Assyrian Empire. His visionary leadership and military prowess set the stage for an era of remarkable territorial growth, where conquest and dominance were paramount in the annals of Assyrian history. Under his rule, the Assyrian Empire underwent a monumental metamorphosis, launching vigorous military expeditions that expanded the empire's dominion to territories previously uncharted by Assyrian conquests. Tukulti Ninurta I's reign was characterized by an unrelenting ambition to broaden the empire's frontiers and establish Assyrian supremacy over neighboring lands and rival powers. With a strategic and calculated approach, Tukulti Ninurta I's military campaigns extended the Assyrian domain, capturing new territories and subjugating vassal states. 
His conquests not only secured strategic trade routes but also bolstered the empire's economic power and control over critical resources, laying the foundation for a serious future prominence in the ancient world. Tukulti Ninurta I's vision and determination led to the annexation of regions that significantly expanded the empire's boundaries, solidifying a serious position as a dominant force in the Near East. His conquests encompassed vast areas, reaching regions as far as Anatolia, present-day Turkey, and the upper Euphrates, considerably extending Assyrian influence and establishing the empire as a major political and military authority in the region. The king's military campaigns were marked by their strategic brilliance and the audacity with which they were executed. Tukulti Ninurta I's conquests were not only about territorial expansion but also about the consolidation of power, as he sought to establish Assyria as a formidable force capable of withstanding challenges from rival empires and exerting control over conquered lands. The reign of Tukulti Ninurta I thus stands as a defining epoch in Assyrian history, where the empire, under his leadership, underwent a dramatic transformation, emerging as a force to be reckoned with in the ancient world. His legacy became synonymous with the zenith of Assyrian military prowess and territorial conquest, laying the groundwork for the empire's future dominance and leaving an indelible mark on the course of ancient history. The reign of Tukulti Ninurta I heralded a seismic shift in the trajectory of the Assyrians. His military campaigns yielded substantial territorial gains, expanding the empire's borders to unprecedented reaches. The conquests achieved under his leadership formed the cornerstone of the Assyrian Empire's future dominion. The ascent of the Assyrians wasn't solely reliant on territorial conquests, it was propelled by their innovative military strategies. They were trailblazers in the use of iron weaponry, a technological leap that revolutionized warfare in the ancient world. Their mastery of iron weaponry, including swords, spears, and chariots, afforded them a formidable advantage in conflicts. Yet, their brilliance transcended mere armament, it encompassed the art of siege warfare. Ingenious techniques like the deployment of battering rams and towering siege towers marked them as unparalleled tacticians in ancient military stratagems. Under the visionary leadership of King Tukulti Ninurta I, the Assyrians embarked on an extraordinary odyssey. Their ascendancy was not merely a tale of territorial conquests, it was an era of innovation, strategic brilliance, and military acumen that would etch their indelible mark in the tapestry of history. The king was surrounded by a large court of ministers, officials and servants. His chief ministers included a chief of the army and a chancellor, who probably headed the large administrative staff. There were also palace officials who ran the huge royal household, buildings and grounds. The role of some of these officials closest to the king, such as the chief cupbearer, must have blurred the line between domestic and public. If he was in the king's confidence then he will certainly have exercised considerable influence over matters of state. The bulk of royal officials will have been recruited from the Assyrian aristocracy. Some, however, came from humble, even slave, origins. A large number of palace officials, as with many eastern courts, were eunuchs. The act of castrating a man theoretically freed him to serve the interests of the king alone, not those of his relations. A vast flow of correspondence reached the palace from all over the Assyrian realm, and beyond. And staff of scribes would have been needed to deal with this, and senior officials and ministers would have had the responsibility of deciding which matters required the attention of the king himself. It is apparent that the great line of kings who ruled Assyria in its pomp dealt with all important matters of state personally, and probably a great deal more besides. The Assyrian monarchy was, again like all Mesopotamian monarchies, hereditary, from father to son. One of a reigning king's sons was designated crown prince, and trained to succeed his father. Things did not always work out as smoothly as this suggests. In the undulating landscapes of Mesopotamia, the Assyrian Empire emerged as a cultural colossus, marked by cities that transcended mere urban landscapes. Among these, Nineveh and Nimrud emerged as exalted showcases of architectural and artistic prowess, testaments to an empire whose grandeur rivaled, if not surpassed, the marvels of its contemporaries. Nineveh, the imperial heart of the Assyrian Empire, projected a magnificence that stood unmatched in the ancient world. Its colossal walls, stretching over eight miles, testified to the might of the Assyrian civilization. Yet, beyond the towering fortifications, 
Nineveh's glory extended to its magnificent palaces, awe-inspiring temples, and a sophisticated irrigation network, reflective of the Assyrians' unparalleled engineering prowess. However, the true splendor of the Assyrians lay not merely in the grandeur of their cities but in the artistic tapestries woven upon their walls. The intricate relief sculptures adorning the palaces depicted scenes of battles, religious ceremonies, and the vibrant mosaic of daily life. These masterpieces weren't mere decorations but vivid chronicles capturing the essence of a civilization at its zenith. The relief sculptures were not static art. They were animated tales carved in stone, encapsulating the vibrancy of Assyrian life. Each chisel mark depicted not just artistic finesse but the saga of an empire's triumphs and rituals, preserving a legacy that spoke through the ages. In tandem with their architectural and artistic eminence, the Assyrians' governance rested on the bedrock of an efficient administrative structure. The bedrock of their bureaucratic machinery lay in the intricate etchings of cuneiform writing, a script pervasive across the ancient Near East. Cuneiform, intricately etched into clay tablets, functioned as the spine of their administrative processes, allowing meticulous documentation of economic transactions, legal decrees, and royal edicts. This meticulous approach to governance wasn't just a bureaucratic necessity but an invaluable repository of historical records, etching the Assyrian legacy into the clay annals of history. Information about Assyrian society is scant. The following represents a best stab at an outline based on current evidence. Assyrian society was divided into three groups, free Assyrians, with free, meaning not subject to personal servitude, rather than enjoying the freedoms that citizens of Western democracies expect, serfs, or dependents, on royal and other estates, and slaves. All three categories had defined rights in Assyrian law. Even slaves were not on a par with cattle in the way that, say, Roman slaves were. The wide-ranging Assyrian conquests did not give rise to a vast slave trade as Roman expansion would, in which human beings were traded on the free market. Conquered populations became free subjects of the Assyrian king, even if deported to another area within the empire. At the other end of the social scale, the Assyrian royal family headed a landed aristocracy which had dominated Assyrian society from time immemorial. It was from this that the bulk of ministers, commanders, provincial governors and high officials were selected. They had estates both within Assyria and scattered throughout the empire. These will have been farmed by unfree workers, whether serfs or slaves. However, the majority of Assyrians themselves seem to have been free peasant farmers, owning their own plots of land. It was these whose obligation to do military service provided the recruits for the core of the Assyrian army. The towns and cities will have had the usual population of craftsmen and workers, but they also had an elite group of leading citizens, made up of priests, scribes, merchants and leading craftsmen plus families of those who owned estates nearby. In the vassal kingdoms and provinces, the pre-existing societies continued more or less as before, unless their population had been completely uprooted. In this case, they soon lost their identity and were absorbed into Assyrian society. They will undoubtedly have been second-class citizens, but probably only for a generation or two before being fully absorbed into the society of the Assyrian Empire. For one of Assyria's enduring legacies was to break down local barriers and create an international Aramaic-speaking society which covered much of the Middle East. During this period in the Middle East's history, iron came into wide use, as we have seen. This must have begun to make farming more productive, as for the first time in world history farmers were able to replace or supplement their implements of wood, bone or stone, which their forebears had used since the Stone Age, and start using tough but inexpensive iron tools. However, although the coming of iron would undoubtedly have a huge impact on agriculture and the economy in later times, the generally poor character of the Assyrian level in excavated sites in countries occupied by the Assyrians, and the frequent references to spoil, massacre and destruction in the royal annals, points to impoverishment, or at best stagnation. Clearly, the tribute exacted from the provinces was so high that economic development was stifled. Similarly, the mass deportation of different peoples might have been expected to foster higher levels of long-distance trade. Of this there is no evidence during the Assyrian period. Perhaps the deportees were too traumatized or demoralized. Perhaps trade was unable to flourish in the atmosphere of constant resistance and rebellion which pervaded the Assyrian Empire. 
Perhaps the tribute levied by the Assyrian government was simply too onerous to leave much wealth over for commerce. In any case, the archaeological record shows no flourishing cities outside Assyria itself. Within the Assyrian homeland, however, the great cities of Nineveh, Haran, Nimrud and Ashur clearly flourished. Kings such as Sennacherib undertook an enormous amount of construction work, erecting temples and other public buildings, restoring towns, and completing great irrigation schemes which boosted agriculture in the country. Clearly, Assyria was benefiting from the wealth extracted from her subject peoples. The Assyrian Empire, celebrated for its cultural splendor and architectural marvels, was also home to a military force that echoed through the corridors of time as a symbol of strategic acumen and formidable power. Their military prowess, a mix of admiration and apprehension, etches an indelible mark in the annals of ancient warfare. At the core of Assyrian dominance lay an intricately structured military framework. Their soldiers were equipped with an array of cutting-edge weaponry, showcasing an unparalleled mastery in the art of warfare. The adoption of iron weaponry marked a pivotal epoch in the history of warfare. The Assyrians, pioneers in this domain, harnessed iron swords, spears, and chariots, endowing them with a significant edge during conflicts. Beyond their advancements in armaments, the Assyrians were celebrated for their expertise in siege warfare. They introduced ingenious methods such as battering rams and towering siege towers, which not only breached fortifications but also solidified their reputation as indomitable adversaries. The annals of Assyrian conquests sprawl across history's canvas. Their extensive campaigns against Babylonia, Elam, and Egypt epitomized an unwavering pursuit of territorial expansion, showcasing a relentless resolve to assert dominion over vast lands. However, beneath the triumphs lay a shadow. The Assyrians acquired a reputation for their unyielding military tactics, leaving an enduring imprint on subsequent civilizations and the chronicles of history. Assyria's imperial power was based squarely on its army. Assyria's military practices had roots in earlier Mesopotamian warfare, however it introduced major innovations of its own. The Assyrian army was one of the first major military force in world history to benefit from iron armor and weapons. Whereas the earlier armies of the Bronze Age and early Iron Age had been built around a comparatively a small number of aristocratic warriors fighting from chariots, under the Assyrians the cheaper but tougher iron enabled the Assyrians to arm many more ordinary subjects. Their army was therefore able to be composed of much larger bodies of infantry and cavalry than hitherto. The cavalry were now largely made up of soldiers riding on horses, and warriors riding in chariots became less important in the army. The Assyrians learnt this new style of cavalry warfare from the Sumerians and Scythians, the horse-riding nomads from steppes of Central Asia. All horsemen at the time rode without stirrups or saddles, but this seems not to have hindered their ability to control their mounts. Both cavalry and infantry formations now went into battle to fight, not as individuals, as the old Bronze Age warriors had done, but as unified, disciplined bodies of troops fighting en masse. Before the mid-8th century, the army was essentially a citizen army, composed of ordinary Assyrian farmers performing their military service. The men called up for a particular year were stationed in camps, before being sent off on campaign. Those not called up at the start of a year might still find themselves called up later, to replace losses or if additional troops were needed. This system continued into later times, but was now supplemented by a standing army of foreign troops, made up of contingents from conquered peoples. These soldiers served for many years at a time. They were able to attain a higher level of experience and training, and, free from the need to return to their farms for the harvest, they were able to serve on longer wars rather than the seasonal campaigns of old. This also allowed permanent garrisons to be stationed at key points within the Assyrian Empire, answering to the provincial governors. These helped to keep the subject peoples and neighboring vassal kingdoms in check. It was from these long-service professional troops that the royal guard, the elite troops of the Assyrian army, were formed. Assyrian inscriptions testify to the importance that commanders accorded logistics. Food and military supplies were gathered together in preparation for a campaign and transported, occasionally using camels as beasts of burden, with the army on the march. Also traveling with the army was a siege train, staffed by a corps of engineers. Their job was to fill in moats, construct earthworks against walls, and dig tunnels. 
they were equipped with the first recorded siege engines in world history, including battering rams, assault ladders and even siege towers for scaling the mud-brick city walls of the ancient Middle East. The area of the Middle East dominated by Assyria was divided into the Assyrian homeland, the Kingdom of Assyria, and a much larger area. In earlier times this was covered by vassal kingdoms, but later much of it was governed directly from the Assyrian court through provincial governors. At the center, if not geographically, certainly politically and socially, stood the Assyrian homeland. Here was located the Assyrian capital, with its magnificent palaces, parks and temples. The original capital, Asher, was also the center of the worship of the chief god of the same name, and long after it had ceased to be the center of government was revered as a holy city. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire at the time of its heyday, and as such was certainly one of the largest cities in the world at that time. Other capital cities at different times were Nimrud and, briefly, under Sargon II, Dur Shurukin, which means Sargon's fortress. The Assyrians were farmers, like all pre-industrial peoples. All land theoretically belonged to the king, and in reality the king did indeed own vast estates. A landed aristocracy also controlled much land. However, and through holding local public office these probably dominated many localities. It may well have been to reduce their influence at court that Assyrian kings shifted their capital from time to time. All Assyrians owed duties to the king. All adult males were liable to military service, and the core of the Assyrian army was made up of such men. When not on campaign they formed a reserve from which soldiers could be recruited. At critical times a large percentage, perhaps even the majority, of the younger men would be called up. Assyrians could also be summoned to undertake other kinds of service, for example working on the royal estates or on large-scale royal construction projects. Away from the capital, the Assyrian homeland was divided into a number of districts. Tiglath-Pilesar's reforms made these local divisions smaller and more numerous, bringing them more directly under the control of the central government. These districts were in turn divided into sub-districts, under local chiefs, probably appointed from a member of a leading local family, and these were divided into townships. Up to the mid-8th century the Assyrian homeland was surrounded by an expanding swath of territory in Mesopotamia, Syria, eastern Anatolia and western Iran, a significant chunk of the Middle East, composed of vassal kingdoms owing obedience to the Assyrian king, sending troops to fight with the Assyrian army, and paying tribute to the Assyrian court. Most of these vassal kingdoms were small states. The exception to this was southern Mesopotamia, which since the days of Hammurabi had been mostly ruled from Babylon. This key economic region was the core area of Mesopotamian civilization, and was treated with much more respect and consideration than other parts of the Assyrian sphere of influence. Here, the Assyrian king posed as a protector of the king of Babylon, fighting on his behalf against his enemies. In return, he expected obedience. Up to the mid-8th century the Assyrian homeland and the much larger, and expanding, territory occupied by vassal kingdoms, made up the two zones of Assyrian power. From the time of the reforms of King Tiglath-Pilesar, a third zone was interposed between these two older ones, as a large part of Assyrian-dominated territory was brought under the more direct control of the Assyrian court. This zone covered much of Mesopotamia and Syria. In it, the small vassal kingdoms were abolished, their kings being replaced by officials appointed by the Assyrian king. These provincial governors were supported by new garrisons of Assyrian troops, stationed in the provinces on a permanent basis. Babylonia also was brought under more direct Assyrian control, but in a different way from the smaller vassal kingdoms. The Babylonian throne was no longer occupied by a native dynasty, but by a member of the Assyrian royal family. Initially this was the king of Assyria himself, who thus became king of Assyria and Babylon. He ruled the country through a viceroy, a governor with very wide powers. Later, a younger son or brother of the king of Assyria occupied the throne of Babylon as a subordinate king. An efficient system of communications between royal court and provincial governors was set up, consisting of special couriers who carried messages swiftly between the king, wherever he happened to be, and his governors. Fire signals were also used. The roads were kept in good repair, Wooden bridges were constructed across bridges and paved ways were driven through mountainous country, to facilitate the swift passage of messages. 
This system acted as the precursor of later imperial road networks in the Persian, Hellenistic and Roman empires. The Assyrians also ran a state espionage service, to keep themselves informed of potential unrest. From the mid-8th century onwards, therefore, Assyria turned from being the dominant power in the region, lording it over numerous smaller or weaker kingdoms, to being a true empire with a centralized government. As such, it would have an immense influence on later world history, pioneering the techniques for administering a huge empire which would be passed on to later imperial states. The Assyrians, like previous Mesopotamians, published their own law code. This was much longer than Hammurabi's, and more sophisticated, in that it went into more detail in particular cases. However, it was noticeably harsher, with more brutal punishments for wrongdoing. This perhaps reflects the more militarized society for which it was intended. In the realm of scientific knowledge, the Assyrians made significant strides, particularly in mathematics, astronomy, and medicine. Their astronomers tracked celestial movements, contributing to an early understanding of the cosmos. Meanwhile, their mathematicians laid the foundation for arithmetic and geometry. Additionally, the Assyrians made notable progress in the field of medicine, employing herbal remedies and developing basic medical practices. Yet, their cultural tapestry extended beyond scientific endeavors. The Assyrians displayed a rich literary tradition steeped in myths, legends, and religious beliefs, providing insights into their cultural ethos and spiritual worldview. Moreover, the Assyrians' linguistic legacy remains pivotal. Cuneiform script, an intricate system of writing etched into clay tablets, served as the foundation of their administrative communication. The legacy of cuneiform script extends its influence to numerous modern languages, signifying the enduring. As the Assyrian Empire stood at the zenith of its power, internal dissent and external pressures culminated in its tragic demise. The decline and fall of this once venerable civilization marked the culmination of internal turmoil and relentless external invasions. Internally, strife brewed as revolts and political instability eroded the foundations of the empire. Discontent among the populace, administrative challenges, and struggles for succession weakened the empire from within casting shadows on its supremacy. Externally, the Assyrians faced incessant invasions from rival powers and rebellious vassal states. The relentless assaults, coupled with the empire's internal fragility, posed insurmountable challenges, ultimately leading to its downfall. The fall of the Assyrian Empire signified the end of an era marked by unparalleled cultural contributions, military dominance, and architectural marvels. Its demise left an indelible impact on subsequent civilizations, shaping the course of history for centuries to come. The Assyrian Empire, once a dominant force in the ancient world, now resides in the realm of memory, leaving behind a legacy of triumphs, cultural brilliance, and, ultimately, a cautionary tale of impermanence. Though time has weathered the grandeur of Nineveh and Nimrod, the echoes of the Assyrian civilization persist. Its remnants whisper tales of a civilization that rose, flourished, and, like many before and after, succumbed to the cycle of history. From the ruins of ancient cities to the ongoing archaeological endeavors, the Assyrian heritage perseveres. It's a testament to the resilience of a civilization that, even in its decline, offers valuable insights and lessons. The legacy of the Assyrians isn't confined to the pages of history books or archaeological sites. It's a living legacy embraced by descendants, scholars, and enthusiasts passionate about safeguarding this invaluable heritage. As the sun sets on the Assyrian Empire, its influence continues to cast a long shadow on the tapestry of human history. Its rise, glory, and ultimate decline remind us of the impermanence of empires and the importance of cherishing and understanding our past. Remember to like, share, and subscribe for more fascinating insights into the remarkable history and enduring legacy of ancient civilizations. Stay tuned for further revelations and in-depth explorations of the world's historical tapestry.